when I get emotional, I'm a bit shaky and I tend to rush things. So I'm doing my best to slow down and hang out with you guys and tell you a little bit about my story and what it's been like, how love has really changed me. Because I feel that after six years, love has definitely changed me. And a lot of the uh, emotions that I've gone through are things that I see reflected in many people around us all of the time, different issues that I see many people avoiding or that they haven't quite faced yet, are things that I know that I've come fully into contact with and seen within myself. I haven't always moved completely through all of them, <laughs> but as some of you know, I can be quite direct about the things that I, I really know are there and um, that have really, by facing them, have helped me grow a lot. Uh, so perhaps, I know I don't know many of you that well, and there's a few of you in the room that have perhaps known me for about the time that I've known AJ. Cornelius and Katerina are probably the only two, but I thought for the benefit of the rest of you, I might give you a little snapshot of who I was six years ago. Um, because it's someone quite different, I think, to who I am today. And I'm hoping I'm going to keep changing. But six years ago, I was a qualified occupational therapist. And I worked in the area of health and rehabilitation with children and adults. And I'd done that for about 10 years. And right before I met AJ, for about four and a half years, I was living abroad. I lived for about three years in Lebanon, two and a half in a Palestinian refugee camp. I was volunteering my time there with um, children and adult refugees, looking at health and their life, quality of life and their life roles. And I was pretty passionate about that. And at the time, I had started a master's degree in international health and development. And I thought I had my life sorted. This is how I was going to spend the rest of my life. I was going to be in Africa or the Middle East or in some part of Asia, working with kids with disabilities and refugees, or even in my own country, because we have a lot of issues surrounding people who, excuse me, who are asylum seekers. And, and I thought, yep, I know what I'm doing with the rest of my life. And um, I, during this time that I lived overseas, I had a lot of experiences with injustice. I was seeing injustice everywhere and I was very passionate about changing that on the planet. And I felt at the time, even though I wasn't very aware of it, there was a lot of rage in me about it and a lot of grief. I was feeling like, how can this be? How can we let this happen on our planet? And actually having lived in a refugee camp and lived in exactly the same way as people have been living uh, in Lebanon, there's about... I lived with 20,000 people in one square kilometre in kind of like what you would call a ghetto. So people for 50 years had been um, living in this situation generation upon generation. And, and I was feeling... I had all of this stuff inside of me, but I had no concept of what it was to feel an emotion, <laughs> of what it was to actually be humble. So I just thought I needed to act differently to change the world. And so when I met AJ, I was quite a, an arrogant young woman. I thought I knew what the world needed. I didn't want to live in my home country anymore because I was judging all of them so badly for not caring about what else was happening for people in the rest of the world. And I also had a lot of feelings about women don't need men, we can do it all. We, you know, And men are just there really because probably one day I'm going to want to have a baby. <laughs> Um, I don't believe in love. I don't believe in a real sense. I don't believe that happy endings ever happen in relationships. I would like to think that. I used to tell myself that I would like to think that. But I couldn't watch a romantic film without scorning it. I, I couldn't sit through it. When I met AJ, his favourite film was The Notebook. And I couldn't even watch it without going... <sighs> You know, this is the, the level of kind of emotion that was inside of me about love. 
which I actually feel really sad about now because it was covering a lot of grief inside of me. Um, I had all this rage and a lot of my girlfriends had exactly, like my friends who were girls, had a lot of the same feelings as me. We were career women, we didn't need men and we had relationships with men but during those relationships we were very condescending in a lot of ways to the men that we were with. I also attracted a lot of men who um, were like my dad. <laughs> they had a lot of sadness, they had a lot of feelings of wanting to um, barter with women, they, they were kind of, I wanted to fix them emotionally, just like I'd done, you know, had this role in, in my relationship with my dad. And I also, because of a lot of the first century emotions that I was suppressing hard, I was suppressing them really hard, and a lot of them involved shame and sexual terror, I also attracted some guys into my life who were quite sexually deviant and wanted, they were doing things in their life or had done things in their life that were quite um, sexually overt or um, immoral. And I unbeknownst to me, I felt quite comfortable in that, even though it was quite um, emotionally dangerous for me. I felt comfortable in that because it helped me avoid the deep level of shame I had. I felt like in the company of this guy, I don't feel ashamed. In the company of guys who had more morals and were, who were more um, into fidelity, I actually felt a lot of unworthiness and I never really accomplished having a relationship with a guy who I felt um, really respected me. But of course I didn't feel any of this when I met AJ. This is just how I was living, thinking, I've got life sorted out, you know, I, I, and I'm a pretty good person. You know, I had this arrogant kind of idea that, well, I'm someone in the world who gives a shit. You know, other people don't. I'm someone who wants to dedicate my life to fixing everything. And, um, yeah, that was pretty hard for me. Eventually, I've come to see the arrogance in that position. Um, I had a lot of judgment coming out of me towards my brothers and sisters who were just living their life and doing their thing and in the, in the way that their, their family had raised them to feel was a good thing to do as well. So that's a snapshot of me. Is there anything you feel I've missed out? No, I don't think so. I think yeah. that's pretty close. Yeah. So that's the me who bowled on home to my parents' living room, um, fresh off a plane from Lebanon, um, to listen to this guy who they'd been listening to speak. And there's a lot to the story of what happened, and I don't need to tell you exactly how we came together, because the point of this story, if you like, or this um, sharing, is to tell you about what it was like for me in terms of love. And what I, I want to share with you what I thought love was when I met AJ and then what hap what's happened to me since and what it's like, what it's been like and what it continues to be like to experience being loved by him and by God. And this is a bit where I get really emotional, so that's good. <laughs> okay, so good morning everyone, come in. <laughs> Let's talk about what I felt love was. When I'm so six years ago. <laughs> Excuse the handwriting because I'm shaking. So, this is what I believed love to be. And I see this, as I said, I see this reflected in a lot of people that we meet now. Still, a lot of you are walking around feeling like love is. When this set of things happen, I feel this, this good emotion and that is love. And it's not always the case. So, what I believed love to be. Probably the major thing that I believed about love was that it involved barter. I, as in, I'll do something good for you and then you'll do something good for me, and that proves that we love each other. And when I do something good for you, you should do something good for me, because that's what love would do. So it was really these two things um, of, say, barter, and sacrifice. So 
So do you guys know what I mean by that? Can you relate to that? <laughs> yeah, a lot of us have grown up in families where, we've, where barter is, is the way you do things and sacrifice is, as AJ pointed, uh, sort of briefly mentioned yesterday, um, about how we view sacrifice as proof of love, that if we, if we deny ourselves, then it shows that we, that we are loving someone. And I very much had that idea that I, in order to love someone, I should sacrifice my true desires, what I really wanted, and that would prove to them that I was loving them, that I loved, that I honoured them more than me. And I thought that's what love did. Okay. What else? I also had a really big idea about emotion. Uh, even though I didn't really understand this intellectually, a lot of my ideas about what love was were based around taking away unpleasant emotions. If someone loves me, they will comfort and soothe me away from my fear and my grief. That's what love does. That's what I felt. So, comforting. How do you think I got on when I, when I met Jesus? That's what I'll talk about next. <laughs> so comforting and soothing emotions, particularly emotions of fear and grief. I, I felt like I'd grown up in a situation where if one person in the family felt those things, then everyone else should rush to their aid, share in that feeling and do whatever we could to take it away. So sharing in emotion was also another big thing that I felt about what love does. So if you're feeling something, then I should feel it with you. That's what love does. Does anyone relate to that one? This sharing in emotions, yeah. Yeah. It's a big thing that I feel a lot of us try to do with each other and more than that, we try to get others to do it with us. <laughs> we, we, we want to tell the big story so everyone goes, oh, and then we feel validated and it kind of helps us stay away from how confronting that emotion is to just feel on our own. Okay. And probably, I can't believe I left this to last because it's probably what I should have put first, was about approval. I felt that someone who loved loved me would approve of me and my family had approved of me for when I met Jesus again I was 29 I think so for 29 years I'd had a lot of approval I, there'd been a lot of barter involved in that I needed to do a certain amount of certain things fill a certain kind of a role but when I did I got heat with approval and within that approval there was no challenge to the, the parts inside of me that were not loving. I just got approval for doing a certain set of things and I could say certain words and no one was ever challenging me on whether those words translated into action or whether those words that were accompanied by feelings that matched them. Do you know what I mean by that? I could say, oh, it's okay, I'm really sorry. I'm sorry I did that, I feel really bad. And then everything would go away, I'd get approval again. It didn't matter if I was really sorry or if I wasn't going to do it again. The, the thing that was accepted was me saying, I feel really bad about myself and I'm really sorry. So even my kind of a self-punishing um, treatment of myself was rewarded with approval. My parents took that to mean, oh, she is sorry, she's punishing herself. And let's move on. We'll give her some approval again. Now, obviously they responded in that way because of the way that they were raised and they're the way that they view love. But what it did for me when I was attempting to be more sincere, if we fast forward a little bit when I, and we'll talk about how I had to challenge all of these things, but when it came to actually really looking at myself and really being challenged with some truth, I would often revert to self-punishment 
in order to try and show that I was sorry because this is the way that I thought that when you really love, that's what you do. Um, and of course, that's not really what love does, but I had no idea about this. And when I'm pointing these things out to you, understand that six years ago, even though I couldn't describe these things, this is what I would have sworn was love. And this is how I responded to people. When they did this set of things with me, I felt they loved me. And when I thought, I want to love this person, I did all of these things with them. So I'll just add my approval at the bottom. Oops. So in that, I, I wanted approval from others. And here, I probably want to draw a distinction between approval and acceptance. Because it is possible to just accept someone as they are. In fact, that's a quality of love. But we don't have to approve of everything within that person when we love them, do we? Can you, under, can you see the difference between those two things? Because actually what love does is challenges the errors inside of us and challenges those parts of us that are not truthful or, or not loving, but still accepts us and allows us to be who we are. But there's an immediate challenge. When there's approval, there's no challenge. It's like, you're great. No, you're really great. That's, what I, that's the message I would get from my parents when I did these kinds of things. And, and so then there was never a challenge inside of me of the things that weren't actually that loving or great. Because this, this barter and this set of, it's probably like fulfilling a role. Is what my whole family unit accepted as love. Now, when I met Jesus again, and I often call him AJ because I, I, cause I always think I met Jesus and then all this other stuff happened and then he was AJ, so I met AJ, but he's really Jesus. <laughs> Does that make sense? And sometimes I use it to differentiate which century we're talking about. But when I met him again, um, immediately, because there was such a strong pull towards him, even though I didn't really like that pull. <laughs> it frightened me a lot. Not because I felt like I was being controlled, but because I felt like I can't do all these things seamlessly anymore. <laughs> and I'm actually not receiving a lot of these things that I, I was receiving from my family. I'm feeling really frightened about what's happening. I, I, my heart is pulling me in one direction, but in order to go in this direction, I immediately lost approval. Like, not just approval from my family. I mean kind of globally. From my friends, from my, my professional colleague, from, from my profession, from everything that I was doing. Suddenly, here's the, here's the um, possibility of losing all approval. And I didn't understand how, like, now I can feel, of course, it was all conditional and it wasn't love. But at that time, I felt like I'm, now there's no love for me anywhere in the world. And also, I, could, I wasn't sensitive at that time to the love that was coming towards me from God and from my soulmate. So let's, let's talk a little bit about what that was like, how, how my soulmate responded to me attempting to love him in this way and how he challenged these things within me. And this, is, this was really six years ago, even though it wasn't very pretty, in that I was quite angry a lot of the time. This is the first challenge I had to, to consider, what is love really, anyway? What is it like to be loved and to give love? Because before then, I hadn't even questioned any of these things. And can you guys relate to, to these things that I'm pointing out? Yeah, I feel like when I was going through all of this, I thought, it's just me. 
I've just got all this messed up idea of what love is. And then as I've worked through it, I go, oh, actually, it's kind of a global problem, isn't it? We, we all, well, a lot of us share these ideas about what, what love is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so immediately that I met Jesus, he challenged, and this is probably both centuries we're talking now. It, it played out a little differently in the first century, but I had a lot of this stuff going on except maybe a little bit darker in the first century. Um, and he, he responded in much the same way at both times. So we kind of met and we tried to have a relationship. First a friendship and then it quickly became romantic. Um, and then it quickly kind of stopped being romantic. <laughs> and I, I actually... I left AJ uh, in the first year that we knew each other. We kind of formed a re- relationship. And then I went through a period of just telling him I didn't have any feelings for him and I didn't love him. I didn't want to be around him. I didn't believe anything. And a lot of that was a product of my complete terror about what was about this lack of approval that was happening in the rest of my life. But a lot of it was also because he wasn't meeting my addictions to tell me that this this approval thing was a big addiction. And maybe I need to give that a whole separate point, which was I thought love was meeting your addictions. When someone made you feel good and, like, did what you wanted, that's I thought that's love, that's what you do. So, meeting addictions. So, while we struggled to commence a relationship and came back in and out of having a relationship, this idea of needing a role and being able to barter with my mate was so ingrained. And when I met AJ, he didn't need me for anything. I mean, nothing. He, did, he could cook, he could clean, he could build a computer, he could fix a car, he, could, uh, he was very bright, he had a relationship with God, he, he was not emotionally needy in the slightest and I actually preferred my men to be quite emotionally needy because then I you know, felt like I had a, a good, uh, I felt more secure. He's not going to leave me, he needs me. Um, and then if I could mother him a little bit, <laughs> by cooking and taking care of some domestic tasks, even though the strong, independent, you know, 20th century woman would have thought that that's not really what... I, I would never have admitted that to myself, but I had a series of relationships where I did do a lot of the domestic tasks and I felt quite comfortable because I felt like it gave me a role and I felt like I was needed, and I could even be a little bit condescending to the poor old male who couldn't really look after himself. (laughs) And also, if I had something I could give him, then it was okay to ask something uh, something that he should give me. You know, he should give me some security, help me avoid my fears, make me feel protected in social situations. Um, So I, I was comfortable with that. I wanted something that I could give so I could demand some things back. And vice versa. I was okay with having some people demand, having the guy demand some things of me, as long as he would give me things. It didn't work. I tried, and for for the first year, I would not even cook anything because I was in such a passive aggressive rage that he could cook better than me, you know. <laughs> So he made all the meals for the first year because I was, and completely I was not self-aware about this, guys. I was just acting out all of this kind of stuff that I didn't even want to see about myself. Uh, It took me a long time to actually really face these things and I mean face them emotionally. It's very different to face them emotionally than us just having a chat about it today. It's good to have a talk about it today because it increases our awareness, but actually coming to face emotionally where this stuff is playing out in our lives, that's a whole other step. It's like saying, oh, I'm not going to barter with you anymore, but at the same time, 
there's a whole lot of expectations that we have that our partner give us things and we should be able to do things. And even though we might even do, I do a rudimentary, I'll just change this set of behaviours, if that emotion is still playing out, either we get very angry because our partner listens and stops bartering or it just plays on and on in our relationship until something happens to really expose just how much barter is going on. That's what happens in a, in a general codependent relationship. Dan, you had a question.